Hi, everyone. Well, Chocolate and Fluffy are now turning this into a game again. Remember, every once in a while when the lights go on, they go and hide, and they're doing it tonight, even though they've been around all day, everywhere I have gone, and uh, they make a game. And I think I'm contemplating the possibility of putting something really fun in here so that they will just stay here uh, on Wednesday nights instead of turn it into a game because I know how much a lot of you with your own cats you love to see chocolate and fluffy and if you were here any other time but when we turn the lights on and we get ready to go there this is where they are and then you know that's why we love cats they're very smart they love to play games they're very unpredictable but there is something about that cat soul and the human soul, it's just, I love them. I love dogs too. I love animals. I love creatures. But that's why they're not here filling up my, my lab. And I want to at least give you another piece of really good news that has happened. And that is we broke through 147,000. So get that champagne ready. And Get everyone that you know to subscribe. Tell them about what we do in this sort of global discussion about subjects that aren't covered many other places. And maybe we can have our champagne celebration by the end of this month in July. And it would just be, I don't know, it's like a metaphor in this terrible age of COVID to have something that we actually set out as a goal and we worked for it and it came. And so I hope that we break through 150,000 yet by the end of this month and spend two hours talking together about all of the subjects that uh, you would like me to talk about and I will try to go through as fast as I can. And right now I have something very very beautiful to show you. This is Stonehenge in England with the new comet Neowise above it. This gorgeous image was taken before sunrise on July 12th by Declan Duval. Tonight is July 15th and by tomorrow night, July 16th, Neowise can be seen with the naked eye as well as binoculars and telescopes about an hour after sunset in the northwestern sky. You just find the Big Dipper and right below the cup of the Big Dipper will be this beautiful new comet. It was first seen on March 27, 2020 by NASA's Near Earth Object Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer Space Telescope. The first letter of all of those words make up the acronym NEOWISE, N-E-O-W-I-S-E. -E. So that's how the comet got its name. It must have had a massive ice core as it approached the sun, getting hotter and hotter. After Neowise survived its closest approach to the sun, scientists measured its remaining ice core at three miles in diameter, which is about five kilometers. Plus, it grew a long, elegant tail. One comet expert, John Bortle of Stormville, New York, recently explained that the comet's tail, in a sense, can be like imagining that it is a thick walled hollow tube with its walls impregnated with reflective dust that is being illuminated by sunlight, close quote. It's like moving light made out of ice. And this glowing icy water will be, visitor will be visible after sunset until the end of July. And after that, it will begin to fade as it heads back out through the solar system in an orbit so big it will not return for another 7,000 years. More solar system excitement was expected yesterday, July 14th, when the United Arab Emirates was going to launch its first ever spacecraft to Mars. Bad weather delayed the launch, which is now rescheduled for tomorrow, July 16th. 
Ironically, that orbiter waiting to be launched is called HOPE. Then, next week on July 23rd, China plans to launch its first ever mission to Mars. And that space rocket is called Tianwen-1. And then one week after that, on July 30th, NASA has the new Perseverance rover ready to launch on a mission dedicated to searching for evidence of life on Mars. In fossils from the distant past to maybe even finding microbes alive now. If all goes well, Perseverance will gather a lot of samples that could be returned to Earth laboratories in the future. And in fact, Elon Musk's multi-billion dollar Starship rocket could one day take people to the moon and Mars and then pick up whatever samples are going and bring them back. And this could be one of Elon Musk's commuting tasks. He thinks that he will be launching in 2024 and by 2030 says that he will have gotten a million people from Earth to the Mars base by running a Starship shuttle that can carry science samples as well as the people. Now, in last week's Earth Files broadcast, I had an interview with Baron Bolton, also known as Buddy. He is from the Bronx in New York, and he did a remote viewing astral projection for me about the alleged U.S. military shootdown of a red glowing UFO in Magé, Brazil, on May 12, 2020. Allegedly, three six-and-a-half-foot-tall, white-skinned, dirty blonde-haired, male alien beings were killed and taken back to the United States by some sort of an American special operations that either came in to the request of Brazil or we were there, had a base, knew what was happening in the sky above Rio de Janeiro, and we took independent action. It's not clear. But during his remote viewing of the shootdown and retrieval events, Buddy saw a military acronym that he thought read J-O-S-A-P, JOSAP. He did not know what it stood for or if he had the letter sequence exactly right. And I searched through military acronym indexes and could not find a match. So last week, I asked if any of you in the audience might have more information about that particular military acronym. After my Earth Files live stream, the next day on July 9th, 2020, I received an email that read, Joe Sapp equals JSAP, Automatic Search and Attack Protocol. I emailed the sender to ask if I could learn more about JSAP, and she said to call her Jane Doe to not give out her location, but she did talk with me about her DD-214 of U.S. Air Force service from 1972 to 1975, when she worked in aerospace control and warning system operations underground at the Montauk Aerospace Defense Command's operations room on Montauk Point, Suffolk County in Long Island, New York. Montauk was networked with the North American Aerospace Defense Command in Cheyenne Mountain, which is only 15 miles southwest of Colorado Springs, Colorado, and built inside Cheyenne Mountain for geophysical protection NORAD was officially created on September 12, 1957, as a United States and Canada organization with missions of aerospace warning, aerospace control, and maritime alerts for North America. NORAD is the central hub for monitoring all air and space traffic over North America using satellites and other technologies in an agreement between the U.S. and Canadian governments to combine air defenses against a Soviet threat. Well, 120 miles east of New York City, 
at the far end of Long Island, Jane Doe got her job working radar screens in the Montauk Aerospace Operations Room because her uncle was a U.S. Air Force general working at NORAD. And her uncle wanted Jane Doe to join the U.S. Air Force in order to work specifically in the Montauk Operations Control Room because she had been a gifted child who later measured a high IQ of 176. Plus, like Buddy Bolton, she was born with the ability to remote view. Remote viewing, she said, was what the Army called it, but the U.S. Air Force called her a scanner. Her uncle also told her that the NORAD network of satellites and radars also had to monitor for UFOs, as her uncle pronounced it. The UFOs, he told her, were very advanced technology controlled by non-humans based underground, on Earth, in the solar system, and beyond. He also told her that the U.S. government wanted to shoot UFOs down to study and back-engineer the technologies. In fact, Jane Doe herself saw half a dozen unidentified flying objects moving in coordination on her radar screen in October of 1973 while she worked in the Montauk Aerospace Operations Room. Jane Doe was watching my July 8th Earth Files YouTube broadcast when Buddy Bolton from Brooklyn described his remote viewing details of the UFO shootdown in Magé, Brazil on May 12th, 2020. And Buddy kept seeing the letter sequence J-O-S-A-P. I'm now going to share with you a discussion I had after last week's Earth Files broadcast when 67-year-old Jane Doe contacted me about her firsthand U.S. Air Force knowledge of a similar military acronym used during her Montauk aerospace radar work from 1973 to 1975. The acronym is based on military acronyms. And the ones that I used when I was working at Montauk, we had JSAP, which was automatic search and attack. It was a certain code call. Okay, automatic search and attack. What does the J translate to be? Julie. Julie, A-S-A-P. Julie, automatic search and attack protocol. When you see that, what is it saying to people who are serving in the military or intel? Shoot it down. When people come into our airspace, if they're not supposed to be there, we send up military planes to tell them, get down. If they don't get down or get out of the area, then we shoot them down. That's automatic. If you were in a radar station in Brazil... And it's a U.S. Air Force and Brazilian Air Force, and let's say that they're collaborating on something, and that they have satellites that could see, let's say, a bank of UFOs like you saw, of six of them coming in over Rio de Janeiro, and that there would be radio traffic about the entry of the unidentifieds over Rio de Janeiro, and there might be an attempt to try to communicate with one or more of the UFOs. And if there is no communication or somebody with authority says, JSAP, automatically the object or objects are to be shot down then. Right. Do you have any sense of why tall, blondes, or dirty, blonde-haired extraterrestrials in a craft that was glowing red would have been shot down by the United States in Magé, Brazil. They wanted the ship. They wanted the ship. Yeah. Do you know if we recognize any other intelligence as being an ally and friend of the United States that we would never shoot down? If they Give us the right signals. Give us the right numbers. 
But if they don't have the numbers, we shoot them down. And where would ETs get the numbers? From us. And which ones have we been working with in the United States? The grays, the little grays, and the taller grays. And the Nords are on our side. Different groups were given codes that they could work with us. We've got groups of them underground. We've got groups of them in the ocean that we are working with. The little grays are, they're more like droids. Droids. Yeah. Well, they're part flesh and part android. They're like computers put into body forms that can move around. Right. And the little grays usually are grown in the pods. That means that the little grays are essentially clones. Right. Then there's the tall grays, which are very, very ancient, very old species. And they work with us, but they can also clone. Their technology is so far above ours. Mm -hmm. They're helping us fight our enemies. And who are our enemies? Those are more machines. They're more like Borgs. Artificial intelligence. Right. How would you describe one of the AI versus non-AI? You can't really tell by look. You have to tell by feel, you know. You can feel if you're with the soul. Okay. Are there the blonde Nordics that look like the reptilians, that look like the grays, that look like the tall whites, that look like the praying mantis? A lot of these groups can change. They can go from reptilian to looking like the Nords. They're changing. So you can't really say by looking at them what they are, because there's so many, there's a lot of deceit, you know. Why is there so much deception between the ETs and all of their varieties and humanity? Isn't there anyone who wants humans to know the truth? Yes. Those that are working with us want to get the truth out, want to get the people to know the truth so they can know who they are, what they are why they are, and where they're going. But we have to search within our own spirit, within our souls. We seem to be such an abused species because for at least the last 12,000 to 20,000 years, there have been concerted efforts by Earth power brokers to keep the evolving Homo sapien sapien dumb and blind on purpose. That's right. Keep us dumb and stupid, and then they can suck our souls. Humans need some definite, here are our true allies. They really want us to survive and evolve and for our souls to grow. These are what they look like. And I keep getting, not just from you, from others, that it is, if you started out on a chess game and you had 16 layers of a chess game, and you had 10 different groups that were playing, that you would end up not being able to tell even who was behind which pawn or rook because we are in a situation where they can clone any body that they want and use it as camouflage on our planet. Yeah. Well, we're in a kind of fog as humans. But we are born with that soul that can decipher. But we have to listen to our soul Mm -hmm. to be able to decipher. And if we can't listen to our soul, we're not going to be able to decipher who's who, what's what, who's leading us down the dark side, who's leading us into the light. We have to hold on to our hope and our love. Jane Doe, like myself, is frustrated that, like John Burroughs, a lot of her documentation, a lot of things in the background, she has never been allowed to have. John Burroughs still does not have access to his original medical record from being in the U.S. Air Force. She also has been denied a lot of her records because she had an extremely classified position for that period of time. And there's a bigger story around her 
that I might be able to tell a bit more about in an upcoming show. Um, but she did say that before he died, her uncle, who was a general at NORAD during that period of time, that he talked to her about the importance of the human soul and reincarnation, the recycling of souls in and out of bodies, as he said, and sometimes with the consciousness of near-death experiences. And we talked a little bit. She had heard the show a couple of weeks ago with the man named Nicholas. And Nicholas had the powerful near-death experience that left him with a tremendous number of questions about the issue of reincarnation. And if you remember, Nicholas ended his email about his near-death experience by saying, quote, why do we reincarnate? What was that realm that I went to created by an alien intelligence to keep our souls here, question mark, still in search of the truth, and no life is a game of chess. At the end, even the king and the pawn go back in the same box, close quote, Nicholas a couple of weeks ago. And now this week on July 13th, 2020, I received this email from Earth Files viewer, Leanne Marshall. And I asked her if I could use it tonight and she said, yes. She began, when I watched your July 1st video about the remarkable experience Nicholas revealed concerning his near-death experience, I felt compelled to write about my own. It was many years ago, sometime during the fall in the early 80s, I was in my 30s and worked as a dental assistant. In the spring of that year, I had lost my younger sister to suicide, and it had been extremely difficult to move on. As a result, I was experiencing issues in my marriage and my job and some depression. Our dental office had just gone through training in CPR, and we had gotten certified. And CPR is learning how to help somebody revive them or keep them going if they've had a heart, heart attack. One afternoon, as I was driving home from work on a busy street, I saw a man lying beside the road with a man standing near him. I pulled over when I could and I ran back to see if I could help. To make a long story short, I detected no breath and no pulse and I began CPR. The training was still fresh in my mind. A man appeared and immediately began to help me. He had been a paramedic in California. Finally, an ambulance arrived and the medics took over, strapping the man to a portable machine that did compressions and they took him away. I learned that the man had not recovered and did not survive what had been a massive coronary. I was able to speak to his family and describe those last moments and they were comforted on some level that he had not been alone and that an attempt had been made for myself. The fact that I had failed to revive this man was devastating. I think that feeling rode on the back of the fact that I had not been able to foresee my sister's suicide in order to prevent that. I cannot remember how long after that event it was, maybe a couple of months or so, that I was again driving home from work on that same stretch of road where he had been lying, when I was almost slammed with a feeling that came from all around me and through me that was so uplifting and filled with joy that I could barely comprehend it. I remember clutching the steering wheel and my eyes growing so big as I was driving the feeling grew into an indescribable experience of love, acceptance, and purest joy. And as I was feeling those things, I was being made to understand that, quote, no matter what happens, everything is all right, always. There were no words heard, just a total understanding that no matter what happens, all is as it is meant to be and all is well. 
In fact, it is impossible for me to describe how incredible that whole thing was. There really are no words that fit completely. I have told others about this experience through the years, family and some friends, and now that I am in my 60s, I know it was a gift given to me somehow, maybe connected with the tragedies I had known. I have passed the message on feeling a responsibility to do so, and whenever I have gone through very difficult times since, I remind myself of that very precious truth that no matter what happens, everything is okay. I just wanted to share my experience with you and tell you that I, among many, so appreciate your intelligence, your curiosity, your passion for the truth, and your capacity to love humankind. Warmly, Leanne Marshall. And I thank you, Leanne, so much. I love you. I love this incredible audience. Your letters and your emails every single week. I seem to be moved to tears, not of tears of sadness, tears that when you feel that pressure in your chest and you know it is your soul reacting to, re resonating with the truth that is coming through your fellow human beings, through their souls, and that, as she says, and as physicists have said, ultimately all matter is entangled. And David Bohm said, all mass is frozen light. And I've had that experience in the mountains of Idaho of seeing everything around me turn into pulsing orchid and white light, everything, including the stars in the sky after sunset. And sometimes when it's rough, like it is now with the COVID microbe, it's hard to keep that in front of you as a lens. But think of this letter. Think of Nicholas's chess game and the pawns and the rooks and the king and the queen. Everything goes back into the same box. And that we are a life form on a planet that's been around here now for 4.6 billion years in this solar system and that more and more physicists are pursuing the possibility that this whole universe is a hologram projected from another dimension. And if so, everything, everything from Leanne to Jane Doe to Nicholas to these questions, why is reincarnation the machinery of this universe? And the answer might lie in the biggest box of all because it was made specifically by a divine field that is never matter, but produces the matter world. Trying to see if under any and all broad range of circumstances, the consciousness, consciousness of life, consciousness of love, can take a whole universe for billions of years and teach those souls through all of these machineries to always choose the light. That may be what it's all about. That may be why that epiphany came to her in her sadness about losing her sister to suicide and feeling like she had failed that man who had collapsed on the street with a coronary. that she tried, we all try. And in the end, whatever it is that we can do and we can share, probably love is the single most important emotion that we can hold for all life on this planet. And that that would neutralize war and death and violence. But we are also babies we're growing and we need to give sometimes each other a break 
what could be coming in the fall. Every doctor I've talked to has told me it could be really rough, rougher than what we've been through with COVID yet. I hope, you wonderful audience, I hope some of these words tonight and Nicholas and others, you'll hang on, you will revisit, you will think about this, that no matter what happens, in the end, if reincarnation is the machinery of this universe, then the soul in all of its strength and knowledge goes out of one container and recycles back through another. Just hang on to that in your mind, thinking about life, thinking about Earth, thinking about other intelligences that know a lot about us and we haven't met them yet publicly. And this could be the revolutionary decade in which it happens and not to be afraid. I love you guys. Peggy, questions, comments? Hi, Linda. First, I'd like to thank everybody for their super chats tonight. So thank you, Moonbird, Sunny J, Mike Martin, David Goldridge, O Wise Owl, Britannia Young, Jamie Cole, Robert Rust, Marin Barrick, Gene Roddenberry, Dolores Graff, Mike Moffat, Brandon Thomas, Vicki, Amy Lou, Dan Heaton, and Rachel R. Thank you, everyone. Wow. I just, how do you guys come up with these unbelievable handles? Every one could be a novel. It's fantastic. Thank you, you guys. Uh, the support means everything to me, and I'm so grateful. And so do your questions. So, Peggy, what do we have up first? First, I have a great question. A viewer would like to know, what if it's not up to anyone to disclose the ET information to us? And what if it's actually in everyone's best interest to not know everything? It's an excellent question. Well, here's exactly what came into my mind simultaneously. It is easier not to disclose all of the truth. But it, to me, it is not fair to Homo sapiens sapiens to keep us in the dark. So those two points of view meet like this. The government has clearly been on a 70 plus year path of don't tell anyone anything. And you could add the dots because that's what governments and military do, until we are completely in control, we know everything that we are up against, we can control everything that is happening, then maybe we can tell the world. I can left brain understand that as a reply, as an answer, as a strategy, and has been the one for the last 70 years. But everything in my soul, everything that I feel as a life form on earth feels that for us to have been consciously denied all of the information, good, bad, neutral, from World War II on about what was being found out, that includes animal mutilations. That may include the creation of container bodies in which to the, the non-humans can camouflage themselves in any body that they make. And some people will argue and say, well, the people in, at the time of World War II, they couldn't have handled it. They handled a world war. We're on a planet where everybody is beginning to separate out because there are so many lies. There's so many manipulations. If we were on a planet where the truth, with a capital T, really meant the truth in every case at all times, then we probably would be, I think, 
humans who would have much more empathy for each other and not so easy to fly off the handle and be mad and fight and ultimately go to war. The whole approach to the planet, if you go back 12,000, 20,000 years, if you go back to the time Samaria and before and to the Anunnaki and whatever civilizations have been here, their approach to humanity that they manipulated into existence through DNA manipulation was we were never to know our source. Humanity, humankind, it must be a remarkable thing in this whole big cosmos. Not because we're perfect, far from it. But the soul itself has to be part of why there's so much interest in humanity. And then if you go from the soul, from the inside out, what do the souls do? The souls give us the ability to create art and music and literature and design and to play sports and to climb mountains and to dive off of cliffs into water below and take off and soar in airplanes and go to the moon and to Mars and beyond. We're up energetic, creative, adventurous. To keep us in the dark about what our real source is, I just think it's unfair. I like things fair. Fairness and truth. If the whole planet lived by those two words, fairness and truth. I personally think that this decade is the decade that we are going to be introduced, whether it's going to be through astronomy or an event that occurs with UFOs in front of us on television around the world, or there are many, many pieces on a bell-shaped curve of how this could happen. And what I honestly think, and here's Fluffy, what I honestly think is that maybe there has never been a better decade in the history of the world than this choppy, COVID, Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter, going out again, three countries now headed for Mars. We may have a, a lot of different representations on the moon. So many exciting places to explore like Ganymede and Europa. It's, it has the potential to be this incredible breakthrough, exciting decade. And right here, just sort of the way sometimes it feels like life always does. Pushing against all of the excitement, all of the evolution, all of the enthusiasm, all of getting out into uh, to the uh, solar system and becoming part of the universe are all of these problems that are weighing us down on planet Earth. So many of the problems humans have caused for themselves out of being babies, out of not understanding. And now this is it. Like this is the decade. The rubber hits the road in 2020 to 2030. We either as humans grow up enough that we all can begin to see, not politics, not politics, that we can begin to see why it is necessary to do X in order to prevent Y. And if then we become a planet that's intelligent and that intelligence and truth run this planet, 
it might be just glorious. Because I can't believe that there could be many planets in this huge universe that are as beautiful as Earth. In some ways, all of the ancient literature said that humans were left as stewards, stewards of this planet. But if you're left to be a steward in complete and total deliberate ignorance, that you don't know what garden you are in, that you don't know why a reptile is your teacher, I'm quoting from the Garden of Eden, if everything had been told openly, maybe all of the wars would have been reduced by half or three quarters. And there's another question. If there are life forms that are very intelligent out there, like H.G. Wells talked about other intelligences in the universe that watched us with cold, steely eyes plotting. And what they want is our soul, which is the implication from Jane Doe and her uncle, the general. Keeping us in ignorance about what we are and what our powerful connection to the divine field is would be a way to defeat us, keep us in war, which produces death, which produces the release of the soul into reincarnation. Wouldn't it be something if ultimately we learned that the, the violent history of Earth was because it was provoked by a certain sect of intelligences that wanted to keep the pot stirred on earth with a lot of war that produced a lot of death, which produced a lot of reincarnation. I don't have any trouble having anybody stand in front of me and tell me every single detail that would be the truth in that kind of a big box. And I think that if we all knew the whole truth on everything, absolutely everything, we would probably be a completely different species in terms of not rushing off to war. So, I would like to see, no matter what it is, I would like to see us be told the truth about Antarctica, the architectures, the Anunnaki's, the possible atomic wars that took place in the solar system from intelligences that warred at that level. And if they made us, it would explain why we might have a context ourselves for war, but that it is some kind of an ultimate trap to kill and maim and selfish violence and wars that cannot be, that just cannot be what the divine field wants to have happen in this universe. And I guess that pressure, the pressure in your chest when you're reading some of these letters that I get and it brings tears to my eyes because I recognize a fellow soul and if we could just relate to each other at that level. Let's try. And let's try to find the ETs that must be doing the same thing. That's what I'd like to know. And then learn about the universe from those that really wanted us to survive, wanted us to grow, wanted us to be strong and learn about every piece of the universe. I would love that. Okay, what about another? Hi, Linda. You use this term a lot, and a viewer would like you to please explain the meaning, the meaning of Homo sapiens sapiens rather than 
Homo sapiens. Oh, look it up. Just Wikipedia. Homo sapien, are, that's a class of standing up primates. And that has included uh, everything from Homo erectus, uh, meaning a standing up primate, that's the Homo, and then erectus was standing up. And then uh, as you come through Denisovans and Neanderthal and you get to Cro-Magnon, the uh, scientists uh, have chosen to call this version of the standing up primate that began with Homo erectus two million years ago, it's Homo sapien sapien. Look it up. And that's the correct category, Cro-Magnon, Homo sapien sapien for this current version of what we'll call uh, the surface humans. And that goes back in a crossfade with Neanderthals at approximately 45,000 years ago. When you hear these papers say humans go back a million years. Not in this form, not in Cro-Magnon Homo sapien sapien. They don't, humans, but the humanoid standing up, Homo erectus, goes back two million years. So it's just categories of all of these evolutionary steps of the standing up primate. And the choice was H-O-M-O-S-A-P-I-E-N-S -O -O -S space S-A-P-I-E-N-S. -S. And that's us. Okay, what about another? Linda, do you believe that there's already structures and machinery on Mars? Oh, absolutely. No question. Um, I guess the first time that I really thought about it uh, seriously was 1988, Denver, Colorado. Um, I was uh, working on... It was a, not a, a documentary project on uh, mutilations. That was back in 79 to 80. But I continued to do documentaries uh, after I had signed that contract with HBO and ran into the government and had all of those blocks. I continued to do work for UNICEF. Uh, I made two documentaries for them, uh, going to Africa and, and doing... Uh, a lot of things like that. So I was in uh, New York and LA and a lot of places and had, um, I guess, an association more than anything with being a documentary filmmaker uh, who had a great interest in the issue of other life in the universe. And that's background for why I would have gotten this call. And uh, it was a man who introduced himself on the phone and said that he worked at White Sands in New Mexico. I was in Denver. And that he was uh, coming up to Denver for a very specific uh, something that he was doing in science. And he said, I've followed your work and uh, I would like to meet and tell you something important that you need to know. And uh, so we met, we had lunch, and this is a short form of what he said. He had a good friend in the Naval Research Lab, which has always had an office and a building at White Sands since World War II and are doing a paperclip and getting the German scientists uh, to New Mexico to develop rocketry and all of that. The, Na the Naval Research Lab has been a very, very, very important component of all things related to UFOs. And in fact, what a lot of people don't realize, it was the Navy and the Atomic Energy Commission. They were the two that were handling and riding that bucking horse of everything that was happening in World War II and UFOs and crashes. So that's the context for why he would be referencing the Naval Research Lab at White Sands. He worked there as a meteorologist in another office because they have to deal with the weather depending upon what kind of missions they're doing exercises on. The weather is very important. That's what he did. And at lunch he said, I was talking with my colleague over in 
NRL, the Naval Research Lab. And he said he knows a physicist who's been to Mars. And I remember, what do you mean, been to Mars? This was 1988. He said, yeah. He said, um, I may have a chance to meet this physicist, and I wanted to talk with you to tell you and to see what questions that you might want me to ask. And he said that the physicist had met his friend from the Naval Research Lab at some something that had to do with science in Denver, and that the physicist had told the NRL guy that starting in 1972, that he had been on six trips to Mars where we had a base inside of a lava tube that graze, uh, just like uh, the Jane Doe said that the grays helped us, that the grays had taught us how to spray something or they made it or there was some collaboration with grays to completely uh, make the lava tube impermeable to the Martian mix of gases and that they pumped in or made some sort of technology that would keep the mix for humans and that the physicist had been in that base on Mars six times. And, and then he said a sentence that I've never forgotten and wonder sometimes if it's hooked now to this period in the 21st century. The physicist told the Naval Research Lab scientists that what we were trying to do and why he had been on these six trips in some kind of a UFO to this base on Mars, and these were the words, because humanity on Earth are like grasshoppers before the winter, quote unquote. And then we had quite a discussion at that lunch in Denver about what a sentence like that could mean. Humans are like grasshoppers before the winter. Well, that was a long time ago. That was in the 70s. But 2020 to 2030 was described to me in 2014 by another physicist that I've referenced who said that this would be the roughest decade, the 2020 to 2030, that there could be a lot of wipeouts of all kinds of life on Earth. And that's why behind the scenes that we have had all kinds of secret space force units. I've been doing a lot of research on this. I'm going to hope to do, a, I hope, a report in a, maybe two months from now about what I'm learning. But there have been so many variations on space forces going back as far as the 50s, and that the idea our government has wanted to get some humans off of this Earth onto the Moon and Mars because of, apparently, warnings about what could be coming in the timeline. Now, are timelines locked in, or are they flexible? depending upon which physicist you talk to, it can be, the, I, the one that intrigues me is that there is a South African physicist who says, and does this with his hands, here's time we're running along in. And every one twenty millionth of a second, the future is dropping into what we call the present. And we can't grab the present instantaneously if the future is dropping into the present and the past is there, we're in this strange unreality with the future. How can the future be dropping mathematically into the present if the future is not already there? That's the block universe concept that they teach at the Institute of Time down in Melbourne, Australia. That's a whole other huge thing. Maybe I can do something about that another time. But what that 
begins to imply when you start thinking about it and reading about it is if the future keeps dropping into the present and the present is made of the past between the dropping future then the idea that in the 1970s that we could have been doing remote viewing time traveling trying to find out what was going to happen in the 21st century and seeing maybe that things were not so cool for part of it that would explain why there would have been some sort of a collaboration with gray aliens get us a base on mars we need to get something off of this earth because we live on an unstable planet i think something like that has happened but again immediately 2 plus 2 equals 4 which is the right thing to do if you have advanced knowledge from advanced intelligences who can move around a universe move timelines pop in and out of portals go from one light year to another dip in and out of the speed of light in order to concoct an artificial immortality all of these things have been described to me as characteristics of the intelligences but on earth humanity isn't told any of it so the disconnect between what homo sapiens sapien could be versus what we are allowed to be is huge that really bothers me Mars has a base. It may have many by now. It has an underground existence exactly as Jane Doe and her uncle, the general, they talked about the underground bases that they knew that ETs on this planet underground, under the seas, all of the things that the DIA told me in December 1999 that I've shared with you guys. And all of this has been happening outside of the we'll call it the life cycle track of the citizenry of the world. And I understand that the leaders of nations will say, well, we can't let China or Russia know. But as long as we are on a planet where tribal warfare is what is controlling the truth, we're always going to have wars. It's just crazy. So, yes, I think there's a base on Mars. I think it is a kind of a back door out of whatever happens on the earth. I think that we have gone out into the Ganymede area. Now, I think that Ganymede probably does have huge underground structures. Uh this solar system has probably been mined, explored, and wouldn't you like to catch up? Wouldn't you like to know everything there is to know about who's been here in this solar system for the last let's let's pick 270 million years? Wouldn't you like to know the truth? There's just so much that humans need to know in order to evolve and to grow. And man, that's what I'm cheering on. That's what I would love to see. So, I think I've come to the end of the time tonight. And uh I look forward to your comments and your emails uh on uh Jane Doe and what we've gone through tonight and I love seeing your letters and get more subscribers and let's break through that 150,000 and do 2 hours and I'll try to go through as many subjects as I can and uh with a little bit of champagne to keep us buoyant and keep on trucking if there is covid and it's bad at least we can all get together weekly in the electron safely 
So on that note, I love you guys. See you next Wednesday.